to think that mm. you or a money manager uh, or investment manager can beat out hundreds of millions of other investors by buying just the right thing, catch it at the bottom, sell it at just the right time. That is not something that can be done consistently and persistently. That, that's speculating and gambling. Following anything that is new and hot and you, it stirs you with what they call FOMO, fear of missing out. I better get in on this but not understand it. You're looking at destruction. Welcome back to the Today Counts show with Jim Piper. Before we jump into today's episode, we'd like to recognize all those who make this podcast possible. The Today Counts show is supported by the generous donors of the Lead Today community. Also, be sure to subscribe and follow the Today Counts show on whatever platform you watch or listen. All right, let's get back to the podcast. We are back on the Today Counts show. I am your host, Jim Piper. I have a special guest with me today. His name is Tim Rosen. I have to make a confession I have known Tim since at least the age of 27. I'm not going to tell you how old I am. Well, if you listen to this podcast, you know how old I am. So we have known each other for a long time. Uh, welcome to the show, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for the invite. And it's a privilege to be on here with you. Yeah, we, we met in uh, Chino, California at a church that I was coming to uh, to serve at. That was a long time ago. A it long was, time ago. It was. Late 80s. Yeah, yeah. I, I do remember that you were absolutely uh, in love with your girl. And and uh, that true. was that was the talk of the town uh, back, back, in, back, <laughs> was in, it? <laughs> back in those yeah. back in those days. Yeah. And uh, I, I remember you to be um, a, uh, a, a thinker. Um, I remember you to have a good amount of ambition and vision. Um, uh, you know, some might even say a bit of a dreamer. And um, I, I love that energy, you know, about you. And so here we are. How many years has that been, Ben? Have you done the math? What is that? 37. <laughs> so I, so you are still, and, and by, by the way, uh, Tim Rosen uh, is the is the founder and CEO, if I said that right, of Financial Compass. He's a financial advisor. He teaches finances uh, wherever the door will open for him, uh, whether it is at churches or other organizations. Uh, you, you are now in... The greater Nashville area is—is is that a, a way to say yeah. it? Yeah, Good. about twenty miles northwest of Nashville. Yeah, yeah. And so, what what I am excited about with this is because as I've been following you from a distance, I've noticed that you've done some writing on finances. Um, you are a Christian, and I've always known you as as a man of faith, <clears throat> and that has brought a lot of wisdom. A lot of uh, and, and a worldview in how you do what you do. I think I've, you know, picked that out. And so I, you know, and as you know, that my initial uh, uh, life, professional life began as a, a banker. And in those days, we were also licensed in securities. And so, uh, you know, we, we got involved in, in um, I think one of the roles that that I had, I can't remember the name of it, but had something to do with like preferred banking. And so you, you would work with, uh, you know, wealthy individuals, uh, from a holistic financial perspective. So, yeah. you know, I got a pretty good education in that, you know, early on. But as I told you before we hit the record button that, I'm kind of a rusty gate now, and I, I could use a brush up. So I'm very excited uh, about this. Tim, what I'd like to do is I was thinking this morning in, pre in preparation of our, of our time together and for the listening audience is that w when I think of finances, um, I, I, I kind of think of them in, yes, there's, there's some broad principles that are true, uh, you know, for, for all of us, no matter, you know, where, or when we are we're at in, in our seasons of life. But I, I tend to think of it as, well, you know, what do kids need to know? And, and when I say kids, I mean, even children, what do children need to know and practice when it comes to finances? And what does that look like? And, and what about teenagers who are in high school, who are now contemplating this big step 
of what they're going to do, you know, after high school and the kids and so forth. Um, so if that's okay, I'd like to start off with, because I think you wrote, you, I think you've written a curriculum uh, that kind of geared to helping young people. Is that right? Yes, I, I have a curriculum both for high school and then I have a, a college curriculum. It's, it's in the form of uh, video lessons and it's up in the cloud and online now. That's exciting. And I, I wrote a series of short stories, be it bedtime stories or devotionals, for parents to read their kids. If we want to start there, we can. You know, we're looking at different stages of life, and yeah. So if you're a, if you're a if, if you're a, a young parent and uh, or or a middle aged parent, and you find yourself with children, um, what what are some of the financial uh, principles and stories that that you think um, uh, we should be we should we should be handing down to our kids? Well. One, we want to recognize as parents that our children are very, they're sponges. They're very impressionable. Mm -hmm. And we ought to be faithful in stewarding that. I know that's an old fashioned word, you know, mm -hmm. stewarding, but we are responsible for our influence. And in a traditional family or a one parent family or a situation where a guardian is raising their kids, um, Everything that we do, how we raise them is greatly influencing them. As you and I speak, we could go back and realize that since we were a childhood, we started developing our own attitudes, outlooks, biases on money. Sure. And it just kind of grew progressively. You know, from a kid, we open up a card from grandma and there's cash. You know, that's exciting. But once we ask, actually start getting a little older and we start making, now we have decisions and trade-offs. Well, which do I like better? Which do I want better? My, my $20 or this cool t-shirt. Now we're starting to get to the stage where we need some guidance, right? Because we're starting to make decisions. So parents influencing their kids. Age-appropriate conversations uh, from... You know, from the, like the playground interaction with other kids, learning to share. So we would start learning, uh, teaching mm. the principles of, of sharing. And it all begins, however, before we start giving them any steps. We want to be mindful of nurturing their hearts instead of managing behavior. Mm. I mean, that is so true with our teens, too. And, and I know yeah, I've made mistakes and, and I've corrected them, I think, with my daughter. But, you know, with, with our son, it was, hey, Rosens, don't lie. Rosens, don't do this. Go to your room. And all of this behavior, <laughs> right. you know, I'm managing behavior. You're in trouble, buddy. <laughs> Rather than nurturing their heart. This is why yeah. we don't do this. Son. Let me sit you down and teach you this. So nurturing their hearts. What aspects of money? Actually, every aspect of money stems from the heart first. How we spend comes from our beliefs. Uh, how how we hold on to money or hoard comes from our beliefs that we've developed. So it's more valuable to develop their hearts. Now, in a, in a way, this is going to vary from family to family because it could be subjective to your family values. But uh, saving, teaching them now the value of work and labor, again, age appropriate by doing chores, helping out dad, um, you know, the, the biblical wisdom is is timeless. And Jim, we're seeing an age now where elected officials are just gaining ground on this momentum of pushing this ideology that work is oppressive. And young people are buying into this. So it starts in the home and we have to teach them that we were created to labor and there's great rewards in labor. If you want a better life experience, then you can work hard and you can work smart and have, you know, better um, life experiences that require money. And so um, yeah, that's, that helps. Me, we're going to start with the heart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let, let me jump in there. I, I really resonate with, you know, with, with that. I, I think that, uh, as it seems as though as every generation uh, expires, so to speak, or, or, or hands the torch to the next generation, we have more and more of these, I don't know what you want to call them, conveniences, white collar advance, advances. I remember as a kid, you know, having my own car, I, I, I would be changing the, the oil. I'm not even sure yeah. where I would take my car to have the oil changed. You know, I guess there was an occasional gas station that also had 
a mechanic. Obviously, I'm dating myself here. Um, but, you know, my kids never changed the oil in their car because by then the drive through quick lubes or lube, yeah. yeah, all of those things, you know, you, you had that and then and then tires and you know, you, you learned how to change a tire by the time you were probably 13 or 14 uh, because the quality of tires, I suppose, and the lack of uh, roadside service and, and, and frankly, the economy. A lot of families would run those tires to where they're bald. I don't know if those of you listening to this, but that, that was more normal then it was, oh my gosh, you've got some tread wear. We, we, we better replace those tires. <laughs> Even though you've got 10,000 miles easy left on them, you better replace the, the, those, those tires. So, it, so when it comes to, you know, work ethic, the first thing I think about is the, um, what we might call today the blue collar or the, the physical labor side, which, um, I still think, I don't know that you're necessarily going there, but, you know, chores tend to be right a, a little more on the blue collar side where I'm using yes. my body versus mm -hmm. versus my mind. But this is, I think, a good thing to 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 mention to start off with. Yeah. Now, let me tell you why what, what what struck me. So the last three mornings, my my wife and I, and it's been hot, but we we had a we're building a, a podcast studio out, out back on our property, and. Uh, we we had it placed next to this you know massive pile of firewood, and you know I I could have called someone to come and 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 uh, you know pay them per hour to move the stack from point A you know to point B, but I, I decided to do it myself, and it was less a financial decision, and it was more that you know I I need to exercise more, and. That's really good exercise. I mean, you're bending over, you're picking up these logs, putting them in a wheelbarrow, you know, moving them 30 yards away in another place. Yeah. Re Lift with your legs, not your back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was. In fact, I, you know, Rhonda <laughs> was out there help, helping us, but I saw her do that where she was using her back and said, no, no, make sure you use your. But, you know, and then the sweat pouring off of, of me and it just, you know, it was, so, so, you know, I, I know that that in some business principles, they will teach um, entrepreneurs, for example, hey, you know, how much do you make an hour? And they'll help them figure that out. And they'll say, well, then you should never move logs from one place to the next because you're losing money. You're going to be paying somebody, you know, $15 an hour to move your logs while you're making $100 an hour. And if you switch roles, you're going to be losing money well it's not always right that's got to be <laughs> taken into context exactly and sometimes you just need to get out there and remember what it's like to labor and mm -hmm. what good comes from that well one is concrete you can actually see the work that that you did no one else in this world cares except now Rhonda and i look out there and we say there used to be a big pile of wood over there, but we moved it over there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it, it is true. And, and I think that uh, I work ethic. I, I don't know why, uh, you know, w when you mentioned that uh, society t tends to be, you know, making work dark, it's that's that's really too bad. For, from a Christian perspective, work has always been a good thing. Yes, mm -hmm. it was made harder, you know, after the fall, yep. but he never removed the blessing of work. That's right. That's right. Uh, the reaping and sowing principle is a yep. positive agricultural idea yep. that is labor, but fruit from your labor, you know, a, as we see. Hey, before you jump back in and continue to talk, I also, you, a, a question popped in my mind. I wonder how much you adjust your coaching to your kids as you begin to notice each of your kids might have a different temperament, Absolutely. Um, right? Um, yep. Because because some will tend to be a little more conservative coming out of the womb, and they don't even know they're more conservative. They're it's just innate, and they and they yep. are more conservative, more careful. And then you have the other one who's a kamikaze, 
does the big belly flop in the pool is probably the same guy who wants to spend every dime he gets as soon as yeah. he gets it. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's when you that's when you teach the law of sowing and reaping that there are consequences for decisions that, mm -hmm. that you make. Mm -hmm. And you start teaching them age appropriately, and you can by taking the time, parents, when there's a learning opportunity, teach it. There's trade-offs. As adults, we make many trade-offs every day, the trade-off of our time. 30 minutes spent over here is 30 minutes I don't have over here. Mm -hmm. So we use our minds, we use wisdom and make those decisions, trade-off of dollars and efforts for those dollars, okay? You earns $20, yes, it's yours, you can go blow it. Okay, now you got nothing to show for it. What did it take to earn those those $20? How many hours or, you know, you talked about blue collar labor. Today, kids are learning at a very young age, um, digital skills. So if you've got a 10 year old that can use Canva and create a graphic for your podcast, then he doesn't have to buy the sweat of his brow, but by yeah. his learning and mm -hmm. abilities, wonderful. And here's where you can teach something. There's nothing wrong with sweeping and, and lifting logs. Yeah, we all need to do that. But, but career-wise, Johnny, uh, um, <laughs> a business is, is more apt to pay you more if you have a skill that they can't do that they will pay you for. Creating a PowerPoint, uh, programming, and, and staying up with uh, computer innovations or shredding paper over there. What's a company going to pay more for? Someone who's going to, uh, you know, feed a shredder or someone who can code and create. And so there's different values for skill sets. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be college. It could be trade schools. And, and so uh, throughout the day, you're going to have learning opportunities at uh, teaching opportunities if you pause and, and teach those. That's really, really good. I hadn't thought about it in that, in that way. Um, really pointing out those opportunities, even, even when the kids are with you and, and you're, and you're going and you're considering, you know, the purchasing of a, of a new car or a used car and even doing that processing out loud so that the kids can be exposed to a higher level of thinking. What, what, yeah. what, what, what is your, what is your view, Tim, on, on, on tithing and, and, and when do we start teaching the kids about things like tithing versus giving? Mm -hmm. um, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts there? Well, thankfully, I can go to scripture um, because, look, it's a hotly debated uh, topic mm -hmm. yeah. among pastors, among those in ministry. Those are those. There are those that are quick to say, oh, it's under the law and uh, we're not we're not under the law. We're free and grace. Um, however, if you look at the whole reason why God cre even created the tithe and it's there. Number one, we have to understand God does. It does not stand in need of our money. <laughs> he owns everything. And we're right. the ones that tend to hold him back with the work that he wants to do. But he's looking at our hearts. In Deuteronomy 14, 23, yes, I know it's Old Testament. However, there's a pause here where he speaks to us on something that's timely. In the bringing in of the tithes, and we even see this before the law, he gives a reason why, why bring the tithes. And God says this, that ye may learn to fear the Lord your God always. You think about how true that is with money. How fast are we to turn to worrying about money as our provider uh, or trusting money. God knew this. God knew that we would be apt to look to money, to love it, to cling to it, to make it a God, to depend on money rather than depending on God. So what happens when we, by faith, we receive our money? And it, this is also in Proverbs three, nine, and 10. And we give of those first fruits. We have to, by faith, say, Lord God, I, I don't know how you're going to do it, but this is your principle. This is training me to depend on you. So this is an exercise in demonstrating my dependence. It's easy to say, God, I trust you. God, oh yeah, God, I trust you. Mm -hmm. Well, when, when you give back to the Lord a tenth and you pray by faith, 
His promises and principles are to provide for you so that when he provides for you, we can't help but give him the credit for it. Not like, oh, I'm such a great financial guy. Yeah. And so it's more of a, is it, um, is it a sin? Are you going to lose your salvation if you don't? Not at all. But I would say you're missing out on this exercise in demonstrating dependence every time we get paid. Elsewise, when else do we really grow in faith? When a loved one is at death's door or someone was in an accident, we hit our knees and man, we need to be close to God now. And now we're crying out. We have a regular opportunity. Again, it's an exercise in demonstrating our dependence on God. And he promises to provide so that he gets the glory and our faith is strengthened. One thing I've never regretted in my, my whole life is following um, biblical financial principles versus Amen. other uh, other things because I, they have just proven time and time again. But also being aware of my temperament, I, I, I'm going back in my memory, and I don't remember if it was my son Jim or if it was my daughter Mandy, but I do remember one time uh, teaching the tithe in a way that if I could go back, I would do it a little differently um, because I'm a, an extremely logical person. And and so I tend to think that the the way that I process something is the way other people process things. I and that's that. not always. Yeah. So I remember I had 10 dimes, you know, sitting on a, on a piano bench at our house. And I, I, I think it was Jim. And, and so I, you know, I, sh I showed Jim what, what a tithe was, what a 10th was. And so I took, you know, one dime and I, and I slid it, you know, to one side and I said, okay, well, this is a tithe, you know, that you give right back to the ministry. And, you know, this is what God tells tells us to do. And I think I did that to show how small it was in comparison to the other nine. Looking back at that, I wish I would have done it differently. Um, you know, though, though that might be mathematically accurate and linguistically um, accurate, the spirit of it is not accurate in the sense that, the, you know, as you said, I heard you use the term first first fruits. That's really what I was wanting to teach. But my logic sometimes has a way in getting in front of my heart. Yeah. And uh, so my engineering self thought, you know, so what naturally what's going on in my head is that I'm buying the idea that this is God's engineering. And, and so a lot of times the, the way that God reaches me is through my logic and then into my heart, where some people, it it strikes their emotion, and then it settles into, you know, some logic that, that backs backs it up. But I, I think that, that teaching, I mean, we obviously a tithe means a tenth. So, you know, that we don't shy from that, that that's fine. But the idea of first, first, mm -hmm. um, honoring God first. I, I don't remember which book it was. I think it was uh, it was a it's a book that was written in the last three years, and I, I forget the name of it. But it was it was not a book of faith, but it had something to do with uh, the power of finance. And I was drawn to it. I'm drawn to anything financial, and so I remember I I, I bought the the book and I began to read the book, and though it had nothing to do with Christianity. Um, one one of the things that's said in one of the chapters is that that they have found that there is a vast majority of wealthy individuals who have discovered, even though they, they might use it in secular ways, they've discovered the power of the tithe where they they tithe. Now they might they might give it to the hospital. They might give it to, you know, this and to that. But just the whole idea that even in the crevices of one's mind, there is something there when they have a worldview that's bigger than themselves. They realize that that e eternity, if you will, is calling out. And I'm getting really spacey in this, but is calling out and saying, yeah, you need to give back to something that is bigger than yourself. 
when, when I when I was your youth pastor, um, Rhonda and I, my wife and I, we lived on what we called the ten ten seventy five five plan, and you know, uh, it was it was tithe ten percent, save ten percent, create a budget of seventy, live off of seventy five percent, or yeah, seventy five percent, and then five. We had five that we would call, I guess we kind of called it our, our slush fund, um, where we would do whatever we wanted to do. Uh, we could help a neighbor out who is in trouble. We could use it for selfish purposes. We could um, uh, give it, you know, uh, on top of. Uh, we, we did that. And though it seemed kind of elementary, uh, it, it served us, you know, pretty well. I don't use that format today but as as these children then begin to start getting into this high school years this curriculum that you're talking about do you is there a kind of a, a format that you uh encourage them to follow what what is what does that look yeah. like yeah let me add to the whole raising your kids part as we transition into teens and such and and that is to say this there's nothing more powerful than demonstrating what you're telling them mm. at every age so may i challenge you dads moms when you get paid and you have hopefully you have the dinner time together and you give god thanks talk about it let your kids know you're thankful god provided you the ability to work mm, that's so good Tim. deuteronomy 8 17 and 18. it's not by, by the strength of my hand that i get this wealth. god gave me the ability we're giving god thanks and by faith we're going to give we're going to tithe whatever it is your family does but let them see that in this day of automation we get direct deposit we can even give online and there's no there's no more action to it there's no mm. let's pray put the envelope in the in the in the uh you know the plate as it passes the offering plate yeah <laughs> talk to your kids thank god let them know why you work let them know when you're when there's a you know, when you need to replace a TV, let them know you're saving for it. Mm -hmm. It does more harm to not talk to your kids about it. And I can speak of this firsthand. My bride, that girl that I was crazy for in Chino, right? So we come together and for 20 years, the first 20 years of our marriage, we would argue about finances. We never stopped to think and to ask each other, how was your upbringing in money? How was mine? Come to find out, her parents did well. They never talked about money, though, but she'd come home for school, for example, and see that there's a new TV, uh, that they replaced the Dodge Caravan with a Lincoln Town Car or whatever. So she just saw that if it was needed and they wanted it, they got it. Guess what? She brought that into marriage because mm -hmm. to her, that's the way you do it. No one talked. You needed something, you bought it. And I'd come home from work our first year of marriage, and I'd see a vacuum, and I'd freak out. Like, what's that? It's a vacuum. I know, but how, <laughs> how did we pay for it? I just bought it. With what? <laughs> you know, what money? You know, that means we're not going to pay the electricity if you just paid cash. And, you know, my upbringing was different for my mom, and it influenced me. My mom worried and stressed about money. Money was her source of security. So here's my mom. Then here's my dad who would give you the shirt off his back and not even think about how it affects the consequences of their household finances. He would just, just give, give, give. And so I was this conflicting combination of both my mom and dad. And we bring this into marriage, you know, not talking about it until ugh, it blows up. So it's powerful to involve your children and have the dialogue, whether it's at bedtime. They're very, they want to stay awake anyway, so uh, they want to stay up. So they're listening and have those talks at bedtime, at, uh, at the, at the mealtime, at prayer. Have those conversations with them. Why do you work? And are you saving up for something? And that you're giving back to the Lord and why? And you're involving them. So that helps them adopt those beliefs as their own. You know, Tim, in, in the context in which you were explaining it, you know, I, I come from that, that, that same idea also that if you were going to get a, a t new TV, you, you're, you were probably saving for it or 
you knee jerked and you put it on a credit card or yeah. worse or worse. Um, in those days, you know, the department stores would have the finance companies and you'd be paying 20 something percent, you know, to, to finance that, that television. Um, a, a lot of people today are much wealthier, um, even when they're younger than, than we were when we, when we started. But your point, I, th I think still stands because if you are in a place where you simply replace things when they need to be replaced and you have the kind of, uh, uh, income and, and net worth where you don't even budget anymore, you need to think about how that is trickling down to your kid's belief system. Exactly. And I think that's your point, right? Is that, yep. is that if you, if you do happen to be a high net worth, high income person, these things that we're talking about are really important. If not for you, definitely for your kids. Right. Um, um, you know, unless you plan on just taking care of them, you know, your, your whole life. Yeah. Because that, very well could be the to to what you said earlier the the reaping and sowing principle of not helping the kids learn the work ethic not yep. understanding the differentiation between you know what you get when you're lazy what you get when you work hard what right. happens when you skin your knee but you get back yep. up mm -hmm. you know all of those things so if 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 money is not a concern for you, don't forget about your kids. And, you could be and doing a disservice to them. You're doing a disservice. All right. Well, let's talk about you're in high school. Yep. You know, there's a lot going on today. Now, we know that uh, we know that the world has changed radically since we were kids. Yes. Radically. Mm -hmm. I mean, technology has made the world smaller. Uh, technology has opened up many more opportunities. The entrepreneurial world has exploded. Yep. Um, big companies have gotten bigger. Um, and so high school students today, in some ways, let's set aside things like um, grammar or writing. Um some are even debating how important that is anymore because of AI and, and all that is, is coming out. But you're a high school student um, and you're thinking about college and you're looking at the bill for college. Now, there are some professions, of course, you have to go to college to to come out on the other side of that of that profession. So so that. That's one thing. But the majority of college degrees um, are not as necessary as they once were, depending sure. depending upon the path you choose. Sure. Sure. If you choose corporate America, you may not need a college degree, but you're definitely going to need some significant certifications mm -hmm. and specialties uh, that you're in. And then, of course, trade schools are beginning to make a comeback, mm -hmm. but trades look differently. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are those students who might say, you know, I want to skip all of that. I just want to get on with my life, find a job and, and go. And then, and then there are those who have that entrepreneurial uh, spark and they probably recognized it, you know, somewhere around their sophomore, junior year um, okay. when they, when they were working. Um, so how do we how do we look at this today? What advice could we give to high school students and their parents about thinking through this? Obviously, debt comes into play here, but you don't always have to go into debt to get through school. Um, but absolutely not. But uh, what are, what are your thoughts on that? First of all, as parents, it is our responsibility to train our children and help them prepare to be responsible, productive adults. Literally, once they're 18, our parenting stops, not our influence. And you mentioned different personality types in the kids, and it could, mm -hmm. that could not be further from, uh, you know, spot on. Um, 
but the principles still apply. Teach them um, a strong work ethic to show up early, to do more than what's expected of them. They'll have favor in the eyes of their employer. They will, you know, they'll get those advances and such. Plus they're honoring God. Um, the work experiences teaches the kids the character building traits that they need to be independent in this world. The struggle through working while you're going to college is necessary in character building. It's important for us parents to realize that the easy way out is not the helpful way out. The quick way, the easy way out, let's bail them out. Let's not have it cost them anything. We're not helping them because we're just training them to expect life to be easy, to be bailed out and to have things handed to them. So in preparation for college, we ought to be careful about insisting on college. Insist on something, but as you mentioned, they may have an entrepreneurial uh, you know, bug in them. Fantastic. Or a trade. They're great with their hands. Um, in my part-time, I substitute uh, teach at our church's school because I want to be around the, the kids and I want to be a good influence on them. And I've talked to a handful of them recently. They want to be welders. Hey, that's great. That's a high-paying job that as as the existing welders age out, there's not a lot of young guys coming up and saying, right. hey, I want to be a welder. So nurture that, but guide them in a direction. Here's what happens. You mentioned the technology and the videos. We have to train them to make the decisions on who's going to influence them. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a new career, right, called an influencer. He's a YouTube influencer. Don't just listen to a YouTuber because he's got a million followers. That can mean that he's quirky, charismatic, or just can keep an audience. Doesn't mean that he's right and he has your child's best interest in mind. So and may, maybe maybe he's an entertainer. Yeah. Yeah, that's what most of it is. Right. I helped, I was trying to help uh, an entrepreneur who owns a, a Korean restaurant in my neighborhood. And she knows what I do. So she asked me, can I ask you a financial question? I'll, I'll get, you know, I'll pay you. I said, no, no, I'm happy to help. Um, and so I was starting to give her the advice, but she didn't want to hear it. She kept countering with, but I saw on YouTube, but, <laughs> but I saw on YouTube, like, look, teach your kids the power of influence and to be discerning as who they're going to let influence them. If they're minors, you parent choose who you let influence. Don't let the iPad be the babysitter and just have the, have their eyeballs in that thing hours and hours on end. They're going to get the influence you don't want them to have. So uh, now as they're, as they're in high school, you're teaching them a, a work ethic. You're talking about college before you get there. If they are, if they are bent towards um, college, let them know, look, if, if, you're, if you want to pursue higher education, your best route is to knock it out of the park in your GPA. Do great in your studies because you want to get scholarships. That still exists. And we're actually seeing prices kind of go down in colleges and universities with all the flack that they're getting and, you know, all the compromise and, and such. And it seems that the value of getting a degree from such and such esteemed college really doesn't uh, to go very far nowadays unless you're going to be a doctor or an attorney. Yeah, as, Even then, it's questionable. Right. Yeah, especially if you use a median statistical analysis versus, yeah, yeah absolutely. Have them chase down every scholarship because mm -hmm. there are some that are beyond, the, you know, from the college that they want to go to. Uh, so scholastically, sports, character, and then Look at a community college for your first two years. Your first two years are your basic classes that you're required to take anyways. English, math, history, computer science, all of those. Why not do that for next to free? Transfer those credits into your specialized uh, school for your uh, bachelor's. You're going to get your general ed anyways. You're going to save a lot of money. And work. Take your classes and have a job. Today, you've got side hustles and side gigs. And, and I know anywhere from uh, parents to retirees still doing Uber and, and Instacart <laughs> and, uh, and things that you can do online using the technology we're doing right now. My, my daughter for the fast, past few years has been tr uh, teaching uh, grade school kids with dyslexia. She found there's this Christian organization that has this system that helps 
them because they struggle and they're not getting the help in the traditional classroom and they're falling behind. She's getting 25 bucks an hour mm -hmm. for a few hours a day on her computer. So there's ways if you're enterprising and you seek them out, you can also work and subsidize and pay for college. There's zero reason to be in debt unless you are hard set and you're not going to change your major and you want to be a doctor. Uh, something that's going to require, you know, years of education and $100,000 in tuition. But even then, scholarships and work, try to avoid the debt if you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. So let's say you find yourself in your in your mid-20s or late 20s, early 30s, you know, and you're you're married. Maybe you maybe you've got children. Maybe you don't. And they come to you for advice. They maybe they they both have good jobs, and they've been you know they've been attracted to your brand. Uh, what, how how do you advise them in a general uh, way to go about their financial future? Uh, first of all, you drop to your knees and you give God praise that they actually at, came to you and they asked for advice. That's uh -huh. the number one obstacle is they're not asking. Oh, that's good. Okay. So when they, when they ask, you got some basic, basic principles, remind yeah. them that, look, there, there needs to be a reason why we do anything. Why, why pursue to make more money? Cause more is better. Mm, something has to be measurable. Mm -hmm. Something has to be fulfilling. And more never fulfills. So have a have a value. Find a a purpose that drives you because the pursuit of more will drive you crazy. You can see it in case after case of people who came into money quickly that they didn't work hard for it. Lottery winners, what have you, and you hear them destroying their lives if there's not a reason behind the more. So the ancient wisdom is better is the end of a matter than the beginning of thereof. So where are you starting and for what purpose? Well, hey, I just want to provide for my family. Great. That, that's a great reason to work hard. And then from there, if, if it's, well, I just want more and more and more. In, <laughs> realistically, as we are recording this, it is very hard for an 18-year-old to go out, uh, get a career, and find a place to rent that's not going to take his whole paycheck. My daughter's getting ready to, you know, get married and they're looking in this area me because so many people are moving in. It's hard to rent a small house for under two thousand mm -hmm. dollars. You know, that's half of their half mm -hmm. of one of their paychecks. And that's just um not doable. So um teach them the have the have the why. They can't just follow their heart. Okay. <laughs> um learn to say no to some opportunities. Yeah, those realities must come against some of their their uh, early but developing values. Um, uh, that you know that would seem very, you know, like for example, when when I think about you know debt, we've we've touched on debt, and you know debt becomes a a, a solution like you know taking four ibuprofen for a headache. You know it's. It's it's something that literally is effective in the moment, but when you when you you know I'm, I was just feeling the the stress of that right. I'm a I'm a young person going to get married. It's going to cost a couple grand to rent a a zero square footage home, and boy that this is how we're starting where we're. We're going from paycheck to paycheck. What happens if one of us loses our job? Do we have any savings? Do we have, you know, we don't have any of that. And so then, then debt happens. But, you know, um, I'm just jotting down some ideas here. I just know that when I've thought about debt, particularly in, in the case of young adults, you know, debt uh, robs you of your future. Now, now debt the word debt itself needs to be probably probably needs to be um you know discussed maybe we'll yeah. maybe maybe we'll get to talk about that and what what I mean by debt but debt has the ability to rob your of your future has the ability to I'll just stick with the same theme rob you of your your generosity um um it, freedoms it, Oh yeah, it, it, yeah, definitely robs you of your freedoms. Sorry, I can't go on that family vacation with you, Dad. 
they just don't have the money. Yeah, yeah. And I, all of these bills. Oh no, I, I hear that. I hear that a lot. I, you know, in in our family, we want to do these family reunions, and cause our family has just exploded in size. But a lot of the young couples that that is their, you know, that is their reason for not participating is simply the cost to get there and to participate is is burdensome. Um, uh, you know, debt definitely increases stress in general. Debt, if it increases stress, it it increases conflict um, in 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 your you know in your family. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, debt debt has a way of chaining you to to live with circumstances that you would not normally have to have to live. So. You know, I, I guess I wanted to bring that out, you know, hearing, you know, just kind of feeling yep. the the weight. I, I think about when Rhonda and I first got married, we were surrounded by friends and we'd walk into a friend's apartment and they had all this nice furniture. It was just amazing. And it was mm-hmm. comfortable and recliners and the big TV. And in those days, big TVs were big TVs. They were heavy and uh, and they're big. And then you go out in the carport and you would see, you know, he he bought a Trans Am and she had her cool car and and they were going out to eat, you know, all the time. And we walked in our apartment and we had an ice chest instead of a refrigerator. We had a bench press that we used to put our 13 inch television on. We we slept in a bed that my mom and dad, you know, gave me that didn't have, you know, a, a bed um, a headboard or footboard. But, you know, it was just there. Uh, we had one car and we had a moped and, uh, uh, but we resisted the temptation to catch up with the Joneses, so to speak. And yeah. yeah, And, you know, it's, it's humbling at at times. Um, Oh, we didn't have a dining room table. So we would sit Indian style on the the floor, you know, and we would, we would uh, eat that way. And, Sounds like I'm telling an old man's story, but you know, it, this Those was around. probably very sweet memories, though. They actually. are. They're they're they were good memories, and I remember how much money we would have in our little system, and we would we would manage that, and um, you know, we we the only time we ever fought about money is when we had money. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, yes, it's true. So I think money doesn't get rid of uh, the the. Conflicts. It, it, you know what? And so, and, and I'm responding to your very appropriate comment. More never fulfills. Yeah. yeah. More just sure. doesn't, you know, fulfill. So um, teaching the teens. Yeah. Let's let's kind of start from the be- the beginning. <laughs> we can we can move on. Instruct them. Teach them that their number one tool for creating wealth is their ability to create or to labor. And with that, they're going to they're going to earn an income. Next comes the decisions. They will make adult decisions. No one gonna no one is gonna thrust it upon them. Make an adult decision. Okay, the Bible calls it striking hands. Sure, I'll take that on for nine dollars a month. Sure, I'll take that on for thirty nine dollars a month. And it's financial death by a thousand cuts when we start taking on all of these bills. Pause and make adult decisions about you look at your fixed expenses first. How much are you going to pay to rent for rent? Don't let it get beyond 40% starting out. And it's going to be a lot, right? Because your income is low and rent's high. Don't let it get in the neighborhood of 40% of your take-home pay. You might need to get some uh, roommates to do that while you're working up you know, towards your desired career. You start making more money. Um, so... We're talking about training our teenagers and the value of of good work and developing marketable skills. And then they're going to earn an income. They're going to choose carefully their cost of housing, utilities. They don't have to make financial mistakes to learn from mistakes. They can learn from others. Teach them. Teach them your own examples, examples that you've learned in life. They don't have to get buried in debt and file for bankruptcy to learn, oh, Debt wasn't a good idea, but teach them to pause and to know the impact of every financial decision. You know, how many times or how many different er ways are people paying today just to watch TV? 
five. You got to get your Hulu, you got your Amazon, get your Disney, you got your what? Yeah. You know, YouTube TV. Be selective. Mm-hmm. And don't fall for that. It's only $9 a month because you keep adding these things up and you're wondering where your money is going. So look at your money, look at your income, write it down, look at your fixed expenses, and then know what your variables are. Variables, you don't have to spend this much money eating out. You can permit yourself, work it in your budget. Let's call it a spending plan. People don't like the word budget. Ooh, it's restricting. Well, no, actually, it gives you permission to spend X dollars a month. Uh, for you know, for coffee and eating out, but then you keep track. Like I'm coming near that amount. I don't want to go over because that means something else isn't going to get paid, like my cell phone bill. So, Tim, so. Did, did I hear you say, in, in context to this, you know, the, the, this young couple, you know, coming up now, trying to establish house, trying to establish a home? Um, did did I hear you say forty percent is kind of the uh, the number? The percentage you don't want to go over for housing. Did, did I hear you right on that? Right, and and it's better to keep that at about thirty five percent. But I, we happen to be recording today, and hopefully your podcast will be evergreen, and people can go back and listen mm-hmm. at any time. But we happen to be in a moment, uh, a time of very high inflation, very high interest rates, and everything, re- uh, it respectively, is going up. It's really hard to find a place to uh, rent. And that doesn't mean we also want to just jump in and buy a home either. You never want to just buy out of feeling uh, pressure. Prices are up. Interest rates are Mm -hmm. up. But you get beyond 40%, you're starting out life stressed out because you still need groceries. You still need uh, utilities. You need to still save money. And it's amazing how fast that money goes. I, I like how you just said that. You're starting life stressed out. You know, I work with a lot of executives, a lot of leaders and the way a lot of people live their life is every morning they wake up having to having to create a comeback and you don't want to start off in life having to make a comeback right you you'd rather live below your means um re- reduce that part of your stress well yeah. I, the reason why I asked you about the 40% because you uh, you triggered a memory in me back in the the banking days uh, when we would do FHA loans, you know, for, for young people and to income ratios. Right, right. And so we, we had a couple that we worked with. One was the the debt of the house to their income ratio, which I wrote down the numbers twenty eight to forty four percent is was kind of that range that we were looking at. So that more or less kind of falls into your what you're saying as well. Yes. Um the other thing though that if you are a young couple and you are thinking about buying a house and and you probably looking at uh uh FHA it's not that clean you also have to have an uh another insurance um that is put on top of you. I mean, what's that do you remember what is that called? I forget what that's called um when you, you might- don't have you don't have the 20% down and um oh FHA will be 3% Right. Um, there's different state programs where where it's a silent second. They'll put the down payment for you, but now you're obligated in bondage to this program where you have to be there for five years. The younger you are, the more mobile you're going to be, and the chances of you relocating are very high. So there's state by state programs where they'll yeah. do. In California, it was called the Chaffa back in the '80s, where they the state puts a 20% down payment for you. I you think, don't pay it. yeah, I think what I was looking for was the MIP mortgage insurance premium. Um, yeah. Yeah. MIP. MIP okay. is something you're going to pay in addition to homeowners insurance and taxes. Right. Uh, when you have equity that exceeds 25%, then you can drop that insurance. And so, you know, that's a couple hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Yeah. It gets, it usually that's, gets that, that's a different podcast subject there about the right way to go about buying a house and, Sure. I'm not a big fan of going in and putting a big down payment simply because it's a lot harder. It takes a lot more time to build up the cash yeah. than the extra 20 bucks it saves you by putting another $10,000 down payment. Yeah, Tim, uh, uh, our time is zooming by. Let, let me let me jump into some uh, other other topics here. Um, I was reading reading some of your documentation on your website and such, and, and you you mentioned that uh, there are some popular ideas about uh, investing that uh, you you debunk. 
Um, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and you suggest other things. What, what are those? What, what are some of the popular things out there that you're going, eh? Well, one, just trying to time the market to think that mm. you or a money manager uh, or investment manager can beat out hundreds of millions of other investors by buying just the right thing, catch it at the bottom, sell it at just the right time is um, the evidence shows that that is not something that can be done consistently and persistently. So uh, that is akin to that, that's speculating and gambling and uh, following anything that is new and hot and you, it stirs you with what they call FOMO, fear of missing out. I better get in on this, but not understand it. You're looking at destruction. The, uh, the truth is the market itself is generous, benevolent, and will reward the discipline. Those that are disciplined. I, I like uh, what the founder of Vanguard uh, has said, among many things, is rather than trying to find the needle in the haystack i gotta find the next nvidia i want to find the next apple before it's apple just buy the haystack <laughs> so that speaks of diversification uh you know what with all the ups and downs overall you look at any mountain chart the history of the markets the markets grow they grow so if you own the markets and not try to time it the evidence shows that just missing out by getting out of the market waiting until it's better missing the best days that hurts your attempts and your efforts to grow your wealth so be in the market be diversified and i'm speaking in broad senses here now you've got your exchange traded funds but it goes more uh, it goes more in depth than that but the principle of diversification dates back to the will, wisdom of solomon who says cast your bread upon many waters give a portion this to seven or eight and it will return again for you know not what evil may befall you. And that verse has been um, taken out of context so many times. What does it mean? Well, Solomon had a navy of ships, but he, but he was a king of peace. Why did he have a, a navy of ships? Because he was a great, successful businessman. He was very wise, and he was in the import and export business. And he knew, and he's telling us, don't put all your wealth on one ship, and you're going to send that out there. And there's a great probability that a storm will tear it up. It'll hit rocks and you lose it all. But if you diversify and you put a ship here across the seven seas, it will return to you. So yeah, diversification is the only free lunch in investing. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a bit of a par there's a bit of a paradox here, is there not? I mean, uh, let, you know, let's go back to the 1950s for a minute, and and for those of us who weren't alive then, uh, when you when you study business, you get exposed to to some of this, but you know the the principle, the the morality, the idea of working for ABC Corporation when you would join that corporation is you would have the opportunity to be bonused through the company stock. You also had the opportunity to buy uh, company stock at a reduced rate. And, and the idea is that you became a company man, a company woman, so that when you uh, retired after you put in your 20 or 30 years in there, you would be wealthy in the sense that uh, you helped build that company and you were smart with your, your, your wages, but you also became an owner of that company in small percentage, but yet significant percentage to where you could continue to take the dividends from, from that company, uh, or you could sell your, your stock and put it in some other kind of vehicle. Um, and, and so the, 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 I, the, the general idea of the stock market is that it is a grocery store where you do investigations of businesses that you want to invest in, a.k.a. owner. So I know I'm going to make some people mad about this, but when you treat the stock market as, as Tim, you were saying, you know, where you're, you're trying to time the market, you're, you're, you're not an owner, you're a gambler. And, um, and, and when you freak out when, when the, like it did the other day, you know, we lost over a thousand on the Dow, you know, in, in one day. And, uh, you know, I heard, I heard commentators saying, well, you know, hopefully people won't be jumping out of windows. And, 
you know, we know that that there's been a history of people jumping out of windows, but that's because of the way. Now, now you introduce, which is not new, but you introduce this idea of um, diversification. Let me take it one step further. I explain to the listening audience the difference between diversification, meaning, you know, I've decided to be an owner in this sector, in this sector, in this sector, in this sector, you know, maybe three or four sectors, um, not blindly, because mm -hmm. there's a moral code too. Do you want to invest in companies that, that produce products and services that may go against your worldview? That's just one, you know, concerning issue. Then there's the financial concern issue, but... But now, now let's go a step further. Um, uh, when people talk about hedging, because diversification is a type of hedging, but then there's hedging at a whole nother level. Um, how do you, well, first of all, describe hedging and, and uh, what some of the examples of hedging are and, and your stance on some of those. Without giving up growth, you can hedge against losses by diverse, diversifying in categories that are, let's use a big college term. It's called correlation. If I own A, B, C, D investments, but they're all closely related to each other, that means when we have a day like the other day, the markets could go down, my whole portfolio is going down. I'm really not diversified. I, diversified. I really didn't hedge against that. But if I owned... Uh, international and U.S. small, and I owned a bond portfolio, then they're not closely related. That means one could go down, but maybe one is one category that I own is up. And what that does is it smooths out the ride for you. You're benefiting from all by owning in time and over time all of these categories without your whole portfolio jumping up and down with the drama of the markets like we saw on the other day. And so it takes a little education to know, well, what category is not closely related to the other? Uh, it's interesting. You mentioned the Dow. I don't even pay attention to it because it's only 30 companies. Uh, mm -hmm. But there are academically identified asset classes, large U.S. growth. That's one. We see that as the S&P. Here's the problem with the S&P. Is it really diversified? Hey, seven companies, the, the tremendous or the fabulous seven make up 30% of the whole value of the S&P 500. And 500 stands for the top U.S. 500 companies. And you're going to have seven companies that's going to move the needle mm -hmm. more dramatically. And you know what they are, right? You've got Apple, Google, Google Meta, you know, Microsoft, NVIDIA, all of these big companies. When they go down, and we had a big tech uh, spanking the other day, and people were dumping, you know, because Warren Buffett had announced, as he was supposed to, 30 days prior, that he's going to start divesting his shares of Apple. Well, people were dumping Apple, and that brought the S&P down. So uh, my clients and myself, we're not heavy in the S&P. It's one category, but it also, but history also shows us that when, when companies peak, they tend not to continue that stratospheric growth. But there's a little bit of going back down to earth. So um, the evidence shows us if you own small companies, companies that started in their garage, Harley Davidson, Disney, Amazon, small companies become big companies. So become part of that growth. Yeah, Dell. So you should lean thing. into it. Yeah. Right, Michael Nike, Dell. Nike, yeah. <laughs> so you, these Tim, are, Tim, don't always so, move up and down. Tim, we're going to, so this has been fun. We, we, we're going to have to schedule another, I told you this would zoom by. We're going to have to schedule a part two podcast so that we can Happy get to. with. So let's, let's, we'll agree on that. But before, before we sign off on this particular one, cause I think we've just scratched the surface. I think our conversation is, is very valuable uh, and, and can continue. But <clears throat> some, for example, would say precious metals um, would be uh, uh, a way to hedge. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've got all kinds of questions about, Precious metals in the twenty in the twenty first century, um, so maybe we can talk about that again. And then Bitcoin. I mean, uh, some people say Bitcoin is a is a hedge. Some say it's the new. Um, I mean, there's a lot of good things, you know, to talk about. <laughs>
And then we really didn't really get to say, is there something that is there is there some kind of a prototype that, you know, and, and you know, you 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 almost fell apart on me when I said, all right, this young couple is coming to you for advice and you kind of lost it. You say, well, that's the problem right there. People aren't seeking advice. Right. Um, the, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it tends to be when they have life experiences that drives them to seek out help, yeah. which is good, which yeah. is good. I was just referring to like when my son hit eight, 18, age 18, it was like later, dad, I'm my own man. I'll do it my way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So there, there, there is a lot still to talk about. And yep. what I, what I was going to suggest is that, so you're agreed that we'll do another pod, we'll schedule another podcast. I we'll, agree. We'll I do call solemnly it, swear. <laughs> okay. We'll call it part two. So, um, along with this idea of hedging, um, um, I'm wondering, is there, is there some type of prototype template, some type of chart, some type of bell-shaped curve? Uh, I'm, I'm seeking, you know, these analogies to to try to explain if, you know, if is there something to say that when I, when I'm in my mid twenties, this is kind of what the, you know, um, if we again we take a median of statistics, I'm 25. This is kind of what my portfolio should look like: 35, sure, 35, absolutely. 45, 55, yeah. 65. And so, and it could be objective and not subjective. Okay. Absolutely. So on top of what we were already talking about, I would love it if that's how we started our next podcast. So, you know, what what would that look like objectively? You know, Troy, and I realize you're going to say, you're probably going to say something like, well, what is your ultimate, you know, objective out here? Um, maybe that's what you're going to say. Maybe you won't say that. Um but I also wanted to make sure that, yeah, I also want to make sure that people heard you say something that uh, now it's it's leaving me. But uh, I thought it was uh, pr pretty, oh, pretty insightful. If, if it's true that more never fulfills and then you think that you're seeking financial advice, but probably what you're doing is you're trying to figure out what your calling is, what, what you, where you feel, you know, this is how you want to live your life. And, and that has a lot to say about how you're going to approach your finances versus, yeah. versus, all right, here's how the world works. By the time you're, you should probably have X amount of million in the bank. Um, uh, you know, by the time you're 65, if you live to 80, you know, that's that traditional approach. And, and sure. I'm sure, and I'm sure there's value in that. Yeah. But I think our conversation needs to be deeper and higher and wider. We'll, we'll have to that. unpack more because there's certainly nothing wrong with more when you're 18 and just starting out and you need, you actually need more to be right. able to rent. Absolutely. Right. But it's like once you're making good money and you just want more, but you can't quantify that. So when you actually make more, are you good? No, it's more. That can't be the goal because it's, if it's not measurable. Yeah, yeah. And so and so maybe what we should do, too, in our next podcast is we, we should probably uh, spend some time really focusing in on these different groupings. If you are that young couple and you are broke and you're trying to figure out, well, I've got a job. My yep. spouse has got a job. But how the heck do we get over this hump? We can talk yep. about that. But I think we do need to come back and talk about the fact that the country's becoming wealthier, uh, it appears. And, and, and some of us are, are raising kids that are so wealthy, but they're so ignorant and we, we might really be messing them up. And we started oh, talking. There's we started, a lot there. Absolutely. Yeah. We started talking about that. And so I think there's, I think there's some really good dialogue that we can have about this. So, uh, Tim Rosen of Financial Compass and a longtime friend, even though you're over there in Tennessee and I'm here in Texas, uh, it was good to see you today. And as soon as we sign off, we'll get our calendar synced and do uh, part two. Sounds great.